there is no other name other than Jesus Christ. No other name by which we can be made free. No other name that we can call on in our times of need and desperation. No other name worthy of praise. God, we pause in this moment just to acknowledge who you are. You have ordained your praise from the beginning of creation. May we not remain silent when we have the opportunity to proclaim your goodness, your greatness, and your sovereignty over everything of life. God, whether we're on the mountaintop because it's one of the greatest moments of our lives or we've just been given news that's maybe not so great. There is none other than the name of Jesus that we can call on. That's the name we lift up today. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you for reaching down, for coming to earth to save us. Lord in heaven, may we never get over that fact that you loved us so incredibly much. Even in the depth of our sin, even with all of our unworthiness, may you be praised. We ask all of this in the one we've been singing about, the one we've been talking about, and the one who is worthy, Jesus Christ. And everyone who is willing said, have your Bible, Romans chapter 12 is where we're going to be this morning. Take your word of the Lord, copy out, and let's take a look at that. We're picking up right where we left off last week. You know, what I love about serving you, my beloved church, is your flexibility, your willingness to just kind of go, okay, Darren, you planned too much. Let's go ahead and come back next week, and we'll follow up. I'm grateful for that. Uh, so let's pick up right where we left off last week. Let's stand together. We read from the word of the Lord starting in Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Don't be conceited. Don't repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Don't take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Churches, we enter into a, a season of prayer now, I'd like for us to pray specifically for our friends in Alto, the Matthews family who lost their son this weekend. We don't exactly know what happened. Uh, it happened at a football game, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily football related. Would you join me as we pray for them? And, and let's take a moment to share our hearts with the Lord. Gracious King Jesus, we come to you as a people who are built in time. You created us, Lord, and you know that well. You fashioned us in your image, and you fashioned us with your power and your authority. But you know, Lord Jesus, that we are limited by time and space. Our lives on this earth, your word says, are just a little bit like a vapor here for a moment and they're then they're gone. We lift up this family, Lord Jesus, in Alto, who has lost this beloved son. 
And we pray, Father, that you would bless them with your power, your peace, your grace, and your comfort. Shower down upon them, Father, such in a measure that they've never known before. For those of us that have the capacity, Father, I pray you would use us to serve and to honor you by being useful in their lives. I pray, Father, that you would bless the other families in our church who've lost loved ones recently. Show your mercy and grace to them as well. We pray for those who are struggling, whether it be physically or emotionally, in their marriages or with uh, things at work. And we pray, God, asking that you would help us to demonstrate truly the change that has happened in us because of you. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We also want to take a moment before we get too far gone and acknowledge these beautiful flowers that are here. These flowers are placed in honor of Wilbur and Helen Roddy and their anniversary. Wilbur and Helen, stand up and let us congratulate you, won't you? <laughs> Helen looks so excited to stand up. She's so glad I asked her to. So, nevertheless, congratulations, guys. We celebrate with you. That's what families do. We celebrate markers like that. Hey, you know, when we read this passage last week, one of the things that we did was we read it in context with verse 2 of Romans 12. Jump back up there because I want you to see something. The Apostle Paul gives us a list in verses 9 through the end of the chapter of what to do. But before we get to the what to do, the Apostle Paul wants us to understand why we're doing it. That's an important distinction, isn't it? It's not just enough to know what. We'd better know why, too. See, when I was growing up, we were told to fake it till we make it. Pretend you know what you're doing, and then maybe, possibly, somehow, somewhere along the line, things will come together and you really will know what you're doing. I want you to see in Romans 12, verse 2, that's exactly opposite from how the Apostle Paul advocates doing this. No, quite opposite. He says this, Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Underline that. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here's where we launch off, all right? Here's what I want you to recognize first of all. This change that is in you, it absolutely can't come because you decide it should. No, the Spirit of Christ has changed us. That's where the Apostle Paul begins. The Spirit of Christ has done this in us. Because of his change, because of what he's done within us, it reshapes us. More than that, the Holy Spirit isn't done with us yet. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, it's a process that's still going. And where does it begin? It starts with the why. Why do we do this? Now, you know, I saw a video this week, and uh, if you're in choir, you saw it too. Uh, Brother John brought it to my attention that I wanted to bring to you to kind of illustrate what I'm trying to say. Go ahead with that video, Doug. <laughs> So the, the series is called, How Do I Know? And a lot of times when people hear the phrase, how do I know, the next thing they say is what? How do I know what? But the key really isn't to know what. The key is to know why. Because when you know your why, you have options on what your what can be. For instance, my why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. My what is stand-up comedy. My what is writing books. My what can be going out with some friends to eat. In fact, another what that has moved me towards my why is a, a web series that we have out now called Break Time. So every Wednesday at 3 o'clock, you should subscribe to the, to the channel. Uh, we do a series called Break Time on YouTube. So 3 o'clock, we drop a new episode. One episode in particular I'm about to show you a clip to. We were in, uh, we in Winston-Salem. So Break Time, this is how it works. I travel the country. I do stand-up comedy probably an hour, hour and a half at an event. And in the middle of my show, I'll just sit down and start talking to the audience. And funny just happens. 
or I'll meet somebody who's really interesting. So I met this one guy, and he said that he teaches music at a school. I was like, all right, you teach music, you know, um, can you sing? And then uh, I'm just going to show you the clip. Check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so um, let, me get a couple, let me get a couple bars of, like, uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Let me, go ahead. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That brought could sing. You know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Um, now, once you give me the version, is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace. Ah. So here's the thing. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time I asked him to sing, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what has more impact because you're walking in or towards your purpose. Michael Jr., the comedian that you see on the screen there, he's a wonderful and godly Christian comedian. If you liked what you saw there, look him up online. You'll find a lot more about him. That video expressed exactly what I was trying to say a moment ago. The first time he sang it, he had the right notes. The second time he sang it, the notes were the same, but why was different, wasn't it? I want to point that out to you because I want to, I want to start where the Apostle Paul does in verse 9. And it starts with not what we do, but why we do it. See, here's the problem that we face as a church, not just ours, but the church internationally. We're so fixated on what we do and sometimes what we don't do that we lose focus and we lose sight of why we exist at all. Is it to keep a list of regulations or to decide who's in and who's out? No, we exist for the glory of God. The church exists to lead others to find hope and life and peace that they can't find on their own. There is no other purpose for the church to exist. We're not here just because it's a beautiful building, although it is, isn't it? We're not here because it's a great preacher, but that's true too, right? <laughs> We're here because we want to bring honor and glory to God. That's our why. Now, what we do, that's a different matter, but let's not forget why. We started. And where does the Apostle Paul begin in verse 9? He starts at the very beginning. Love sincerely. Love must be sincere. Now, in the Darren Wood International Version, it reads like this. Love without hypocrisy. That's the term that actually appears in the Greek. Don't be a hypocrite in the way that you love. Now, how would you love somebody hypocritically? How would you love them without sincerity. You would do it by saying one thing to their face and something else when they're absent. That never happens in our culture, does it? Surely none of us have ever done that. If you have or if you've seen it, then you know that's insincere love. And that's the opposite, directly opposite 
of what we're to be about, more importantly, of why we're to be about. When we do that as believers, what does it say to people about our faith? It says it doesn't mean much. Aren't you glad, wait for this now, aren't you glad Jesus didn't do that for us? He loved us wholeheartedly. He threw himself aside and put us first. Oh man, now that's good news. What that says is that love is clear when it's sincere. I want you to see love defined. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, the Apostle John does us the great service of helping us understand love, that we might bring it from a, a, a theoretical compound to a practical one, to a pragmatic level where we can say, okay, how do I do that? In verse 9 of chapter 4, 1 John this is what the Bible says. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Here it is defined. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So what does that mean? How do we understand love? Well, we'll start here. Love is sacrificial. You will know love is sincere when it's sacrificial. So what's the opposite of that? When it's selfish, it's not love. Love is sacrificial. Here's a second element to it. Love put the, puts the needs of the beloved ahead of the needs of themselves. You'll know love is sincere when love elevates the needs of others above their own. If we get that much done, then I think people will understand love. See, this is the problem that we, we face as a church, as a culture, uh, in our culture right now. People don't understand religious organizations. They don't value denominations quite the way that they used to. There used to be a time when I first started pastoring 15, 16 years ago that just by virtue of the term pastor, there was some panache, there was some respect that went with that. Most of that is gone now because, frankly, we've lost it. Maybe someday it'll come back, I don't know. But why does that happen? Because the church, not necessarily just limited to ours, but the church at large, we haven't shown sincere love. Here's where we start, church. Getting our why right begins by loving each other sincerely. Now let me pause for a moment here and say, Central, you do this well. When the chips are down and people are hurting, you come through every time. It has been amazing to me to watch that happen over and over and over again. I'm blessed by that. I'm honored to get to serve here and be a part of that. I found you this way, so I can't take any credit for it. But I got to tell you, that blesses me because what it does is it communicates to people in a powerful way, sincere love. When you step into the gap for them and put their needs ahead of your own, then amazing and powerful things happen. Sincerely love. Here's the second thing that we're going to do, and it's actually a two, twofold. Hate evil and hold on to goodness. Those two pieces come together in the second half of verse 9. That's exactly what it says. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Now, let's start with the first part. Hate evil. Now, the very term evil in our culture, in our context, it's a word that gets kicked out a lot because, after all, what's evil for me might not be evil for you, right? Wrong. All right? Let's make sure we're understanding this. Evil is not a slippery definition. God has defined it clearly by what is outside of the confines of his will. Evil exists. He even has a name, and his name is Satan. Evil is present in our world and always will be until Jesus comes back to redeem us and fetch us home. Why do people get squeamish about saying something is evil? Well, a few years ago somebody did, and everybody ridiculed him. They said, <laughs> what does he know? He doesn't know anything about evil. That's ridiculous. You can't call someone evil. No, I don't call anyone evil. I call actions evil because God does. 
Now, what does that mean? It means that there are some things that are automatically out of bounds, just off the table, that are evil. Now, what do they look like? Well, let's start with one that's easy to find, to define. Murder. Murder. If someone kills another human being, we regard that as evil and we abhor that, unless that's an unborn child. And then we flip the whole thing. Wait, wait a minute, that's women's choice. You can't tell that and that's evil. I'm here to tell you, church, it's evil. It just is. God's word says it is, and I'm not judging anybody that's done that. If you're here today and you've walked through the pain and the difficulty of an abortion, we're not judging you. We're just saying, as a whole, that industry, that concept of abortion is evil, and it just is. It's not a value judgment on my part. It's value judgment based on God's word. And I'm telling you now, if we're going to get our why right, we're going to have to agree with God that he's right. And we're going to have to say, that's evil. I'm limiting it to that, but the truth is there's lots of things we could throw on the table and say, that's evil, that's evil, that's evil. If it's outside of the confines of the will of God, it's evil. Now, some would say, well, Darren, that's pretty restrictive. God's word is pretty narrow some places. Yeah, I know, it's kind of like guardrails. Pull that first picture up, Doug. This guardrail. There's danger on the other side of that guardrail. Wouldn't you agree? And there's danger that somebody recognized and said, you know what, let's protect people by putting these guardrails in place so they don't accidentally drive over them. They might slip off. These guardrails exist to protect them. God's word has put up these guardrails for us. And then, as if that wasn't enough, its warnings are clear, like this sign right here that says, don't go beyond the guardrail. I chose this one because look at the guy on the other side over there. (laughs) He's completely ignoring it, going, hey, that doesn't apply to me. I'm not, what do I care what the sign says? You know what? When we cross those guardrails that God has put in place, bad things happen, like this cow. (laughs) If you're listening to us on the radio, I'm so sorry you can't see this picture. This cow has tried to clear the guardrail, and he made it halfway. Uh, But clearly he's in need of some help to remedy his situation. Amen? So another option, though, if we choose to ignore those guardrails, is that other bad things can happen. I don't know if this is a real picture or not, but it doesn't really matter because the point is the same. Those guardrails exist to protect us. Yes, they limit our freedom, but there's a reason God chose to limit our freedom because sometimes we'll even hurt ourselves, won't we? Evil exists, and when I agree with God that something is evil, that guardrail stays in place, and it protects me from, tang- from playing around with it. Here's the, here's the thing about that occurs to me about it. Perhaps you heard this week that Playboy has decided they're not going to publish nude images anymore. Well, I, I applaud their, their wisdom there, but when I, when I read a, an article about it, I realized the reason they're doing that is not because they've come to any moral stand. It's because there's no money for it anymore. It's so prevalent on the internet. Pornography is so easy to get now. What's the big deal? Well, that's the problem. That's evil, church. Pornography is evil. And every time that we dabble in it, every time we stip, stick our toe in it and make out like it's no big deal, like some victimless crime, we're disagreeing with God and going beyond those guardrails. What should we expect when we go outside those guardrails? A crash. And it won't be pretty. Hate what is evil. He follows that up real quick, though, by saying, hold on to good. Hold on to good. And the imagery that he's presented is one, not just where you grab it with your hands, but where you grab it with your hands and then you wrap your arms around it and your legs too. And man, you're holding on to that thing because you know if you let go of it, there's bad things going to happen. So you hold on to that thing for dear life because you know that you've got to have that. Why? Because God is good. And those who are his will be marked by goodness. Hold on to what is good. Here's the next thing that he mentions. Jump down to verse 11. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor 
serving the Lord. Here's another evidence of a changed heart. Stoke a white-hot spiritual fire within you. That's what Paul is calling for. Don't let your zeal go lagging. Serve the Lord and so stoke that fire. You're going to get a chance to do that next Sunday night. We're going to go across town and serve at Pine Creek Apartments. We're going to do a fall festival for that apartment complex in that neighborhood. And man, it's going to be fun. We're going to cook hot dogs. We're going to give children candy and rot their teeth out. And we're going to, we're going to have an awesome time. But you know why? Because we're there to serve the Lord and love those children and those families. Now you might say, well, that's somebody else's problem, Darren. Not, they're not my children. They're not my families. Oh, yeah? They're here in town with us. We're with them. Stoke a white-hot fire by serving the Lord. Here's what I observe. When someone isn't serving the Lord, then they're serving something. And that will pollute the flame that God put in their lives. I brought a picture I want you to see. This is a series of four flames. The one on the far left, number one, the tallest one, is a flame that is filled with impure oxygen. There's pollutants in the flame. The Bunsen burner that it is being used, they didn't turn the oxygen up. And then as you move from left to right, the oxygen level gets turned up. The more to the right you go, the purer the oxygen is that's feeding that flame. So by the time you get over to number four, that's straight oxygen feeding that fire. I want you to see how white hot it is. Well, what do you make of that? Well, here's what I make of it. When you feed the fire of your soul with purity, things happen. Does that mean that the fire won't be hot? No, that, all four fires are hot, I can promise you that. But it means that that white hot fire that God so delights in us having only comes when we put pure things in our minds, in our hearts, in our bodies. Here's the thing, God wants to fill our minds and our hearts with his word and his presence and his power, but we crowd him out with so many other things. I'm as guilty of it as anybody. Don't make out, don't go away from thinking anything less than that. But what I'm saying is, when you get up in the morning, make the first thing that you encounter God's word. When you get up in the morning, make sure that you're making time for an encounter with him. When you get up in the morning, make sure that you're planning time to spend as a family with the word of God and in prayer. Not just around the meal table, but always. Make it a pattern of life. You want your home to be a different place? You want this church to be a different place? Then start by stoking a white hot fire within you. Here's another evidence of a changed heart the Apostle Paul mentions. Seek a vision far beyond what your eyes can see. Our eyes will play tricks on us sometimes. So he's calling us in verse 12 to see things differently. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. The one I want you to see is the middle one. Patient in in affliction. This is not something I'm terribly good at. How about you? When I'm being afflicted, I want it resolved now. Anybody with me? I want it to be taken care of as quickly as possible. Remedy it fast because I don't like it. Patient in affliction. It is a recognition that affliction will come and that I'm going to see it through God's eyes. It's followed up and preceded by Joyful in hope. In other words, I know there's a hope yet ahead for me. And uh, faithful in prayer. In other words, constant. God is far more interested in faithfulness than he is success. So put all of the three of these together, and what does it mean? It means you're going to have to use something other than just your eyeballs to see where you're going. Seek a vision far beyond what you can see. Here's the thing I know about our eyes. They can deceive us. I brought a couple of pictures to illustrate my point, like this one. A couple of knuckleheads that found a spot where they could make it appear that they're holding the Eiffel Tower in place. Now, are they genuinely doing so? No, don't be ridiculous, Darren. Of course not. But our eyes can deceive us. Here's another one. A guy that has convinced five or six of his 
closest friends to embarrass them by making it look like he's blowing them off of his hand. Here's another one, and this one's my favorite. When you see it from one angle, it looks like things are a little out of skew. But if you turn it, you see it for what it really is. You see it's really just three lunkheads laying on the ground. But flip it back the other way, and you'll go, hey, wh what's going on with that picture? Something is unusual. Brick doesn't usually look quite like that. What I'm calling you to is to change your perspective, how you see things. Change how you observe things. Change what it means in your life. See, the problem is, too many times, we can't do that because we've gotten to a certain place in our Christian growth where we've said, hey, you know what? This is as far as I'm going. I'm stopping right here. I can't, I, it's too hard to keep growing. Too much is expected of me if I keep growing. I'm just going to stop right here, and I'm going to stay here. Well, that's all fine and good, maybe, but what if we took that same idea and plugged it into any other area of life? Watch this video, and you'll see what I mean. Good morning, Reagan. Good morning. Good morning, Madison. Good morning, Johanna. Good morning, Good morning. Johnny. People are always asking me why. Why do the same thing every year? Why not move on? But I say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Johnny. Present. I'm comfortable. I know the routine. United States of America. And to the Republic. And I don't want to brag, but I'm pretty popular around here. I do really well in sports. No! No, not my house. Well, I'm just very successful yes. here. Why would I go and mess that up by graduating? A B. But don't. I mean, in the first grade, I may not know all the answers. D, D, D dog. dog. E. The hours are longer. I hear they don't even have nap time. I mean, I just don't see the upside. Then first grade leads to second grade, second to third. It's really good. Then you're in high school reading boring books with no pictures. Three, four, five. But he was still, still hungry. hungry. Next thing you know, people expect you to get a job and give up summer vacation. <laughs> no, sir. I think I found my niche. Thank you very much. Home sweet kindergarten. Besides, I mean, what if I failed first grade? How humiliating would that be? Nope, just don't think I could handle that kind of embarrassment. And sometimes wonder why you. That was not a good choice. Very disappointed. And that's easy to laugh at that, isn't it? And you go, oh, that guy ought to know better. But I'm asking you today if you've made the same mistake he is, where you got to a place where life got hard and you decided, you know what, I'm not going to grow anymore because God's going to ask more of me. I'm not going to grow anymore and become uh, a more spiritually minded person because it's hard. I'm not going to grow anymore because things got complicated and, and I didn't see it coming and I'm, I'm hurt by what's happened. I'm not going to grow anymore because then people will expect more of me. I want to tell you, God delights in seeing us grow. And we do it by taking each one of these levels and plugging it in. I saved the most difficult one for last. It's the one that's the most difficult to keep. A response differently than expected to our enemies. That's what Paul spends the last portion of this chapter in. And I want you to see especially verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now that's different than the rest of our society, isn't it? That we're told to get back at our enemies. I want you to see there's a threefold step to getting things right and treating people differently, treating our enemies, if such a thing exists, treating them differently than they expected. Here's the first one. Bless them instead of cursing them. 
Bless them, Paul says. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. He says it twice to make sure we understand. Bless them. How do you bless them? Well, sometimes you bless them best by not cursing them. Sometimes that's the best you can do. But it means that you recognize that we are not fighting a battle that is purely physical in nature. We're fighting a battle that is spiritual in nature. And our enemy is Satan himself. Bless and do not curse them. Here's the second one. Don't give as it has been given to you. Don't give as it has been given to you. Instead, seek peace and do your best to receive it. Offer grace as freely as you've received it. Well, wait a minute, Darren. You don't know what they did to me. Yeah, I understand, and you're right. I I don't know. I don't know. And if we sat down to talk about it, I would probably agree with you that what they've done to you is wrong, and the way they treated you was wrong, and it deserves punishment. But that's why the Apostle Paul illustrates his point by saying, don't seek to repay. The Lord will take care of it in his due season. Here's the last one. Choose peace when you can and work to retain it. That's the verse I read to you a moment ago. It's the hardest one to keep. It's hardest because it calls on us to see things differently. It's hardest because it calls on us to choose to recognize that what we have is not our own. It's hardest because it calls to us to recognize there is evil and we must hold on to goodness. It calls to us to love sincerely and do so with a fervent heart, a heart consumed with fire. So what does all this mean for you today? What does this look like if you take it home? Well, here's what it means. It means that we must acknowledge that we cannot do this on our own. God does not ask you to take all this as a list of rules and to check them off your list and say, okay, I've got that one, I've got that one. No, as the Spirit of Christ indwells you and the Spirit of Christ works within you, these things will be the natural overflow. They will flow from the inside out. In other words, the why of your life will overcome the what. And the why will take over and become the what. Why you do will be expressed in what you do. The power and authority of Christ comes from within. So if you're here today and you say, hey, you know what, Darren? I've never invited Christ into my life. This doesn't make any sense at all. It won't. Without the work of Christ in your life, without his indwelling power, without him speaking into your life, it won't make any sense at all. The first step for any person is to invite Christ in to be the Lord and master of your life. Jesus, I can't solve this. I need you to solve it for me. That's where it begins. Maybe you've done that, but you've never been baptized. You know what? Today's a great day to come down here and say, man, Darren, I've I've never taken that first step of obedience. I, I, I invited Christ into my life, but I never have done anything about it. Come down here and let's get that started. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, Darren, I I did that, I got saved, I got baptized, but I've fallen away, I've not loved sincerely, I've let my spiritual fervor die off. You know what, this is a great day to come to this altar and say, Lord, rekindle that flame in my heart. Or if there's a sin problem in your life, then bring it down here and say, Lord, I don't want that sin anymore, I recognize it as evil, and I'm leaving it here. In just a minute, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper The last thing I want you to do is to do so with a mess that you know in your heart. Get it straight. Maybe you need a church home. We invite you to join us as we serve the Lord here. If the Lord has spoken to you about making a decision, do it now. Pray with me, won't you? So, Lord, we come to you with humility. And we say, Father, we want our lives to be driven by the why we want our lives to be motivated not out of a list of rules and regulations but out of desire to accomplish the purpose you set before us to honor you and to draw others to you we ask Lord Jesus that you would be honored in this time of invitation 
And I pray, Father, specifically for those under the sound of my voice who are struggling right now with making a decision. I know that Satan is giving them 900 reasons why they shouldn't, why they can't. I pray that you would overwhelm all of them, Lord, with your powerful love and that you would draw them to yourself just the same. I pray for those who are here today who have a problem, who have a struggle that they need to bring to this altar. And by doing so, bring it to you and leave it there. I pray for those who need to be a part of our church, that you would call them out, set them aside yet again, Lord, and grant them the, the, the strength to come down here and join hands with ours as we walk this road. If you, Lord, if you be lifted up, all men will be drawn to you. So, Lord, we choose to exalt you now. Show your power in this place. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. So if the Lord has spoken to you about making a decision, here's your chance right here and right now. Stand with me, won't you?